experience. <coughs> right. The next thing. <coughs> pray for divine truth. I just want to define pray. I'm not talking about sort of kneeling down, you know, hands up, talking to God. I'm not talking about that. Right? What I'm talking about is having a desire in your heart for God's truth to enter you. As soon as you have a desire, that is a prayer. So right at the moment, if you have a desire to harm somebody, that's a prayer too. It's not going to be answered by God, of course, but it is still a prayer. God still feels you longing for that. So whenever you long for anything, that is a prayer to God. If you long for a friend of yours getting healed in some way, that's a prayer to God. If you have an emotion directed at God, that is automatically a prayer to God. Does that make sense? Yeah, but what is a prayer that the, like chants and prayers, what, what category or effect do they have in relation to that? None whatsoever. So in other words, if you say Rosie 350 times, it doesn't matter if it's... Unless you have an emotion while you're doing it. Yeah, so it's the emotion, not the... It's the emotion, it's not the action, it's not the repetition, it's the emotion you feel while you're doing it. That's the prayer. It's so Is this why when you go to church, even though I'm not religious toward a church, you have a certain feeling? Yep, because there are people who are there who are open emotionally to connecting to God, and so that resonates with your openness emotionally to connect with God, and so you'll feel that. So it's actually, you'd actually be feeling a residue or a semblance of divine love in that area. Yeah, in, in almost every, almost in every religious format, whether Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, all religious formats, there are people within those formats that are all connecting to God in a feeling way. And every one of those people are receiving divine love. Right? They just don't know in many cases how to replicate that. They don't realise that it's not based on their belief structure that they're feeling divine love. It's actually based on their passion and their desire for God that they're feeling it. And once we understand that, we can replicate that. We can do that and, do, and build that desire within ourselves. Yeah. And so we don't need words. We don't even really need thoughts, per se. No. But if they help us, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So use them as tools to connect with the emotion. Let yourself feel the emotion towards God. And it's the emotion that is, that the emotion is transmitted. You know, most, a lot of people say that, you know, things can't travel faster than the speed of light. But your emotion travels instantly across the universe. It's actually your emotion that transcends space and time. Do you understand what I mean by that? I can prove it because the instant you feel an emotion for God, and a longing for God's love, and if it's pure, you will start receiving God's love at that same instant. Right. Now, where is God? He's outside of the universe he created. Right? He's bigger than the universe he created, so he's further away than the furthest star, and yet the instant you feel for God is the instant you get a feeling from God. So that means your emotions are the only <coughs> thing, that's the, this is the sole part of you, the sole part of you can transcend time and space. And it's happening all the time. We're just not aware of it in many cases. So from a purely physics point of view, it's your emotion is the thing that can change all of these things around you, even time and space. So when you have a longing in your soul to experience God's love, God's love will instantly begin flowing to you. If it's a pure desire and you're not resistive, it will instantly start flowing into you. And so therefore, wherever God is, and, and God can be, like God is bigger than the universe, and the universe is an appendage, I suppose you could say, of God. It's not, not God itself. God is an, a, an entity that created the universe. So therefore, God is bigger than the universe. And you could almost say, conceptually, outside of the universe in a way, but managing the universe through all of his energies, or all of her energies, and yet, you can communicate with that personal being just by having a long, just by that long. Does, does it have any physical effect? Like the, the old religion of the shakers, 
the evangelists in America with their um, uh, <coughs> speaking in tongues. Does that actually is that actually created by the effect it has on you, or is that just a self-imposed effect of your intellect? Um, it's different in different situations. Um, but mm. God's God's love as it enters you certainly has an, an instant emotional effect on you. You'll be <coughs> overwhelmed with emotion as you're receiving God's love. Every single time you receive it. Because every single time you receive it, your soul is getting pushed out and expanded even further. Your capacity to experience emotion grows and grows and grows. When, you, when that happens, other abilities come to you. So when you receive more and more divine love, what happens is other abilities will eventually come to you. When God, through grace, decides to give them. So like in the first century, 50 days after my death, they experienced lots and lots of feelings and emotions dur during the period of my death to the 50 days afterwards, with me reappearing with them as well and so forth. And so what happened was there were 120 people who were connecting with God's love so much that all of a sudden they started being able to speak different languages. And they were assisted through that process <coughs> by spirits and everyone else who God was, who God was assisting to actually help the message spread in a much more rapid way. Does God have a sound? Um, no, God, God's silent. So if you hear sounds, it's, it's once again your physical manifestation sort of thing. Yeah, what happens is uh, when God, God communicates with you via emotion, but every emotion it has encoded in it pictures, thoughts and sounds. So you can think of it, who of you know much about a uh, transmission of television pictures and radio pictures and so forth, yeah? Well, you know that there's a basically a carrier signal, if you like, and then a modulated signal which actually carries all the information. And you could picture, you, you, could, you could think of uh, what God is sending to you as modulated emotion. And the modulations in this emotion cause sounds and pictures and thoughts to appear inside of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's like, it's the same way that a TV receives its signal in a way and, 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 and turns it into a picture and sounds. So if you're open all the time, you'll get whatever you're perceiving will be there all the time. That's right. And the closer <coughs> you are to God in terms of your emotional condition, the more accurate the modulated signal will be unmodulated, if you like, or, or, or expanded. Yeah. Isn't it true that you talk about God being out there, but isn't it also true that actually God is inside us and that, that what we see as the universe out there is actually a projection of everything that's actually, like the whole universe is within us when we go into darkness or no, the nothing, that that's where the universe actually is and this is just a... Yeah. physical manifestation of what's actually within our own... The belief you're stating is actually yeah. a sixth year spirit belief. It's a spirit, it's a belief that all spirit, many spirits on the natural love path finish up believing. The truth is actually that God is not inside of you. God is actually an entity that exists and existed before you even existed. And God also has the ability to be inside, or part of God has the ability to be inside of you, but only when you ask for it. So many people feel that we were all born with God inside of us. The truth is actually quite different to that. If we were born with God inside of us, God would have already broken one of our own laws, and that is the law of free will. But is that what people talk about when they talk about realising God? You know, that people have a point in their lives when they, they realise they don't know God, but then they suddenly realise God. Um, all realisation of God is, is due to them beginning to receive divine love. In other words, there's a feeling in their soul where they begin longing for God. And all of a sudden, at that moment, the communication, you could say, begins between God and themselves. And as God's love starts entering them, they actually realise that there is this entity outside of themselves that existed that they weren't experiencing before, but they are now experiencing. So... The, the, a lot of the New Age beliefs nowadays actually prevent you from having divine love enter your soul. And the way they prevent it is by causing you to believe that you already have it. And if you think you already have it, you're not going to ask for it, or you're not going to ask for more of it. 
And so my, my suggestion is view God differently. View God as an entity outside of yourself with whom you can have a relationship. In other words, view God and yourself as in a parent-child relationship. God's your creator. God's your father and your mother. View God that way in this personal way and then realize that you can personally connect to this God through the longings that you have developed within your own soul, within your own emotions. And if you view it that way, you will have completely different experiences with God than you will have if you already view God to be inside of yourself and going into nothingness. Do you, do you understand the difference between what I'm trying to present? See, most six fear spirits believe exactly what you presented. And that's why they never, ever get to the stage of one with God. They believe themselves to be at one with God. They call themselves Christ conscious. But in reality, they are not experiencing because of the emotional connection. That, 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 you know, they are intellectualizing what is an emotional connection. And they have some false beliefs about God. You can't be at one with God without having the same beliefs God has about herself in you. Does that make sense? So what I'm suggesting is give away all of your current concepts about what you believe God to be. Right? And ask God to tell you what she is. And be open to that emotion. Right? So give away all of these concepts. Is, you know, most of us have lots of religious concepts that we've been presented. Um, most of us have lots of reading that we've done about all these different concepts of God. I'm suggesting give all of those away and instead now just emotionally connect with God and allow God to tell you who and what she is. And you'll find you'll have some very, very different concepts about God very rapidly appear to you if you do that. And this is what part of humility is, being willing to actually give away my own definitions even of God. If I'm willing to do that, I'm willing then to accept God's truth. See, the problem is for most of us is that we are so connected to our own truth. Many of us have spent tens <coughs> of years trying to discover this truth that we now have, that we feel we now have within us, right? Right? And so what we have a tendency to do then is hold on to this truth and grip it tightly and f we find it very, very difficult to attempt to even give it up. My suggestion is you are going to have to give up all of your own concepts of truth and allow God through this emotional connection <coughs> between yourself and God, allow God to define her truth to you. And if you completely allow that experience, you will find some really strong definitions of truth come to you about God and about who she is and what she is and all those things. If you allow that experience emotionally. If you don't allow that experience emotionally, you will hold on to your own concepts of truth and your own concepts of God. And if you do that, what will happen is you're now, and when you think about it, it's quite a proud thing or an arrogant thing for us to attempt. It's very arrogant for us to attempt to define God to ourselves. We're actually wanting God to conform to my own concept of God. My suggestion is the opposite of that. Allow God to, to tell you who she is by this feeling connection that goes on. This feeling connection is the way that God will do it with you. And you won't need anyone else in that process. It's all just between you and God. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? So, this part, the divine truth, that's why I said, seek first, like, the truth will set you free. Right? The truth, the truth, I'm not talking about your truth sets you free, that doesn't set you free. Many times you hold on to your truth and you'll be stagnant for a long time, right? It's when you release your own concepts of truth and you accept the divine truth, God's truth, by this emotional transaction, that the truth will set you free. There was a, a thing going around, I think it was on the TV, about um, uh, give up your free will to God. So, of course, it seemed like a really good thing to do, so you do it. But, I mean, and then you feel like uh, an Indian giver if you're going to say, well, actually, you didn't really want it, and you didn't, so I'm going to take it back. 
you don't feel good about it. So exactly. Do, do you think God's going to give you a gift and then say, "I want that back from you now"? If you freely thought you gave it back, so I'm talking about the effect on yourself. If you think you actually gave it back, yep. even though it wasn't taken, taken up because it wasn't there anyway, or whatever. Yeah. You sort of feel like an Indian giver if you just say, "Well, you didn't really take it, so I've got it back. So now I'll open up to the other part." You sort of feel like you're yeah. cheating in a bit, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But the, the truth is that God gave you this beautiful gift of free will. And God doesn't want you to now make yourself selfless to God. God actually, what God wants you to do is to recognise all of your own desires and to be passionate about them and really go for them. That's what God wants you to do. But God's also saying to you, do it in harmony with love. So all of your passionate desires that are harmonious with love, just go for them. And the more you grow, the more you will be in that state of going for those those things. You won't give yourself up. So a lot of people on the, who get presented with the divine love path sort of feel like they've got to give each other, give up things, right? But they don't have to give up anything about themselves except their concepts about God. God's going to teach you about yourself, but you're going to have to give up some of your concepts about God. Because God's also going to teach you about herself. Yeah. The third thing same principle with prayer. Here I'm not talking about sitting down and saying the words. Words mean nothing in the end. Right? What matters is if there's an emotional content attached to these words. That's what means something. And you think about it with all your transactions with other people. When does it mean something, really? It means when you, you can feel something between the two of you, isn't it? That's when, there's fit. That's when it really starts happening between you and someone else. When you can feel the transaction, whatever that is, between the two of you. It's the same with you and God. So, long for with your heart, divine love, God's love, to enter you. When you do that, what, what, when you do these two things, what will happen is God's love will enter you and start exposing your own emotional condition to yourself. Right? So when God's love enters you, you'll go through an emotional process where you feel overwhelmed. Let yourself be overwhelmed. Right? A lot of us don't. What we do is we... Oh, I'm getting overwhelmed now. I've shut this down, shut this down. You know, this is too powerful. Shut this down. Well, yes, every time you experience divine love, it will be overpowering. Because God has infinite amount of love and you've got a limited amount, right? So as you're receiving more, it's going to expand you. So let yourself be overwhelmed. Let yourself be overpowered. I did this with my kids. Um, restricted them. Yep. Um, and two weeks ago, I found that... Uh, very difficult for my daughter to. Um, uh, she went through a really hard time while we were there, and um, I think I'm learning some emotions out here. Yeah, um, that's good. And there's kind of guilt and, and want for her to be able to release. Yeah. Um, so what is there that I can do? Um, from an example, as a parent, you can do lots. What you need to do is actually feel the emotions within you of shame or guilt about when you've harmed your child. There is a, another law that we talked about last night, which was the law of repentance and mercy. And in the way God's love works, and this is about part of God's love, one of the laws involved in God's love, is that when we go through, when we've damaged other people, and we allow ourselves then to recognise the truth of that, and then we go through a <coughs> process of remorse, about that, feeling sorry about that, and we direct that remorse to God, God actually reaches in and helps us pull out of us, and pulls out of us, in fact, the emotion that created the thing that we're remorseful about. So, so you're shutting down your, your daughter in such a way that caused her to feel what she's feeling. If you can allow yourself to feel the remorse you feel about that, and just allow yourself to see how much it's affected her life and how much it's affected your relationship and how much it's damaged you know, some, probably the, her relationships as well. And if you can allow yourself to see that and feel about that and connect to that, 
then while you're releasing that emotion of that towards God, God can reach in and pull out the cause or reason why you did it. But if, and that's what's called grace. Have you heard of that term, grace? That's what grace really is. God's yeah, mercy. Help. Yeah. As soon as that causal emotion is out of you, what happens to her is she automatically feels a change in you. Do you follow me? Automatically. Remember your soul instantly communicates to everyone around whether they are aware of it or not. Your soul will automatically transmit a different feeling to her and she will then feel enabled to deal with some emotions that she's currently shutting down because of that causal emotion inside of you. Do mm. you follow me? Yeah. Yeah. So if you allow that process to occur, then what happens is it will automatically change her as well. And there's been, like last night there was uh, some ladies there, weren't there, who described how they'd, how they'd actually work, work through some causal emotion and all of a sudden their four children just changed toward them. Right. And that, that is something that happens. So it's something we could do with the counsellors or the people with the road, for instance. Exactly. The same goes with our causal emotion. We change the causal emotion about how we're feeling about all of that which will all be related to childhood events or whatever, what will happen automatically is the people around us will adjust to suit us. Now, can I give you another illustration? Like, um, This is some of the power of the soul that we have unrealised within us, right? I was, I was driving along um, towards... There's a few things I needed to get done at home. Right? <laughs> One of them is that I've got these two eco-tents they call getting built at home, but I've got no way to build them and I'm not a builder. And... Uh, and also, I haven't got any time to build them because I'm out travelling all the time doing this kind of thing. And, and also, uh, we were travelling to, myself and my son were travelling to another uh, location to do a talk like this with about 100 people there. And while we were going there, I needed to pick up some CDs from one place, I needed to drop off some plans to another person, and I needed to wash my car. <laughs> that was the things that I wanted to do as I was driving. And all I did was have that thought. And it was all attached to feelings. I just wanted it to go as smoothly as possible was the feeling. What happened was I rocked up at a town where we were going to wash the car and the man who, had all, who wanted the plans wanted to meet me. He, I didn't say anything to him. He met me at the car wash. Right? And he gave me the DVDs and CDs that I needed because he'd picked them up from somebody else. And, and also, he happened to be the same guy who decided to offer all of his time for two weeks to build my eco tents? So he, he's a builder, and he had two weeks off work, and he said, "I'll build your tents for you." Right? And that all just happened in one interaction, just from longings of the soul. So I can do this within seconds. Yeah, yeah. The key, the key with a lot of our emotion is obviously because we've locked down a lot of stuff. It's not often seconds that we, we can actually feel the emotion. But seconds after we've felt the emotion, things will change. Yep. That always happens. Thank you. And sometimes it's a few days later or something like that. I've had another thing where um, I had some soulmate emotions to work through. And uh, my soulmate didn't want to... She, we met up, spent some time together, and then she didn't want to spend any more time with me. And... Um, so I was really, you know, there were feelings of rejection and lots of other emotions came up, right? So what I did was a, for a period of nearly nine weeks, I, it was about eight weeks, um, I cried for nearly five hours a day for eight weeks. It took me that long to get through all of the causal emotions about it. When I felt the last one leave me, three days later she called me and she wanted to catch up again. So I didn't talk about it with her and force her to catch up with me or anything like that. Just dealing with the emotions within me caused that different attraction. From what you said earlier, AJ, by us dealing with our own emotions um, that have probably come from our parents, we're going to help our own children? Automatically, yes. yes. Yeah, so the, what happens is that uh, there are some laws involved with parent-child relationships. One of them is... If the parent releases an emotion that, that they have within themselves, the child, if they have a similar emotion or damage from that emotion, automatically goes through a process of release 
without them even sometimes being consciously aware of it. And so you'll actually have even adult children changing towards you as a result of you dealing with the emotion that you feel about the issue. Yeah. Do you have a, like a perfect relationship with your family? I mean, knowing what you know and uh, all the different realms. Well, let me describe what's happened over the last 12 years with my family. All right? um, 12 years ago, um, I left a religion that was really quite, sort of, could be described as an abusive sort of a religion, whether it comes to emotion. And my whole family was in that religion. Right. Now, what happened was, I left that religion and the entire family did not speak with me anymore. And even my own children um, stopped speaking with me because of the religious viewpoints that they had. So I went through a process where I was totally alone. Even all my friends stopped speaking with me as well. So 12 years ago, I was by myself in a very emotional state with none of my friends and none of my family. They... My friends and my family all considered me to have died. Your friends were also in this religion? They were all in the religion. All of my friends were in the religion too. It was Jehovah's Witness faith. Yeah. And, and what happened then is I started working through my emotions about that. The first set of emotions I started working through were about my sons not speaking with me. <coughs> and that took me a year and a half to work through those emotions. Um, and I didn't do this, by the way, with God's help. So that's why it took so long. I just did it, I knew that I had to deal with my emotions. And by the, I was a bit upset with God at this point, right, in my life. And so, uh, so I didn't deal with that emotion, but I dealt with the emotions about my sons. And what happened was, within a year and a half after, that, after those events, they came to live with me. They decided to come to live with me. Then the next set of emotions that came up were some emotions about my mother. Right? And that, again, I didn't do it with God's help. I just had to do it by my own, the old, the, the, the law of compensation way. And that's what I did, as I plugged away with that. And what happened is my mum changed towards me over that time, and she began speaking with me. Then I had some emotions to deal with about my brother. And what had happened is that, uh, yeah, it was a long story, and I won't tell the whole story, but... What had happened is I'd told some truth to my brother that he'd never known for 25 years. And so he never spoke to me either. And then what happened was me dealing with those emotions again. And now my brother speaks to me. In fact, in fact, my mother and my father and my brother just recently, two weeks ago, came to visit me. Even though they're still in this faith. They're still in the same faith. And it's a sin to visit me, but they still visited me. Right? So the whole dynamic between myself and my family has changed completely <coughs> just by me dealing with the emotions of it. Right? Um, Anjay, do, can we help our parents who have passed by clearing our stuff? Um, it's not the same if your children are trying to help the parents. Right. The reason why is the parents are often responsible for the children's emotions. Mm. So oftentimes what happens when the child deals with their emotion the parents go through some resistance and anger and guilt and shame and all those emotions. And particularly if they're in the spirit world. It can help them, because it can help them connect with their guilt and their shame and their anger and all those emotions. What if they're actively helping you to go through it? Yeah, uh, many after they pass, and if they've been passed for say 10, 15, 20 years, many of them by that point have dealt with a lot of their emotions and are trying to help you deal with it. So many times that's also occurring. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. As well as um, as clearing the um, sort of things that we've done to our children that hasn't been for their good, does us apologising to our children help them to deal with their emotional stuff? Very much so. Very much so. As soon as you get into a state of humility mm -hmm. about your own emotional state. Your children are automatically drawn into being in a state of humility about their emotional state. That happens quite often, very rapidly actually. Remember, humility is a condition, not a thought though. So it's a feeling, yeah. not a thought. Yeah. That happens. And remember too, we've been talking a lot about sort of negative emotions. But remember, every positive view emotion too has its effect. Right? So every time you act on your desire, on your real desire, 
that has a positive effect on everybody around you. Children, everybody around you, all are going to respond positively to that positive desire you have. Did you follow me? Yeah. Just so, I, yeah, I don't know who other people are, but judgment, um, judgment comes into myself and uh, I guess you lambast yourself a bit too by doing it, while you're doing it. Yep. After you've done it, whatever. Yep. Similar thing, how do you just go back to the emotion of what you, why you're judging yourself? Why you're judging you? yourself, yeah. Personal judgment is actually a very damaging emotion. It's, a very, it's also a shutdown emotion, in that it shuts down underlying emotions. So if I'm judging an emotion, let's, say, let's, let's look at a very simple situation. I start to cry. <coughs> And instantly I stop crying because I'm judging my crying. I feel that crying means that I'm what? A sook. A sook. Not manly. Not manly. What else? Weak. Weak. You, can you see straight away that if I feel any of those emotions, then I'm going to judge my crying straight away. And that's going to shut down the crying. So I've found myself that judgment emotions have caused me huge amounts of problems. Right? And the, why they've caused me so much trouble is because, and, and this is what happens, is that you have a cause of emotion come up. It pops its head up, if you like, through the <coughs> attraction. But then you judge it. So now you've got to deal with all the emotions about your judgment, and then you've still got to deal with <laughs> the cause of emotion that you were judging. Right? So it is much better if you can actually work through the emotion you have in, with your, within yourself as to why you want to judge yourself. And that emotion generally is an emotion of deep personal shame about something. If you can work through that emotion first, then often then you stop judging yourself with all your other emotions. Right? I found myself working through that emotion right down the end of my progression, and so I got this double whammy every time I dealt with emotion. I first had to work through all my judgment about what I felt about myself. So it's like, I, you know, I'd make a mistake. And then I judge myself for making a mistake. I shouldn't have made a mistake. Right? And what? And so instead of instead of addressing the emotion of what caused me to make a mistake, well, I'm judging my mistake now. You know, and so everything got doubled up then, and and it was so frustrating until I learned myself that I needed to stop judging myself, and I needed to just like judgment is not humility. Judgment is saying, this emotion you're feeling is not on, mate. That's what judgment does to you, basically. That's like anger. It's like anger, but it's a, different, it's a different form of control. There are a lot of controlling emotions that shut down you. Um, one of them is guilt. Guilt is another one of those emotions that shut you down. You know, judgment, you know, anger, fear of punishment. You know, there's lots of those kind of things that shut you down emotionally. And what I've found myself is that I didn't know about this at the time, but what I find now is if you can deal with those emotions, the, the shutdown emotions, then the other emotions are dealt with a lot easier, more easily. But if you, if you try to deal with the causal emotion and every time have to deal with one of these other emotions as well, then it gets really complicated really quickly. So you, you, you actually saying there that you found but also the concept that you're a reincarnation of Jesus, and we think sort of like we, we were taught to believe and understand that Jesus sort of knew everything. Yep. And then you've gone through all the different levels of understanding, so I mean, yep. you must know a hell of a lot. So I mean, if you recall all that, how can you now say that the way I understand it because what I'm going through now, why don't you just know anyway? Well, the truth is that I don't know everything. <laughs> And the truth also is that my first century experience was that I didn't experience this process of becoming at one with God from a condition of sin. So I didn't have all of these judgment emotions back then. I didn't have all, any anger with myself or anger with others back then. I didn't have any, like, I had grief at times in my life, only through the law of attraction, but I didn't have these deep emotions of unworthiness back then. And my choice to return in the manner that I have was based around my wanting to experience these things that almost well, every single other person in the spirit world had experienced except for myself. So you actually have to do it personally, experience instead of knowing how to do it. Yeah, so before what was happening was 
I would know what the emotion was within the person, I would understand the emotion in the person, but because I've never experienced coming at that emotion from a condition of error myself, it seemed a lot easier to me than it seems now. Does that make sense? Now, now I'm really starting to grasp about of how difficult this process is of processing these emotions from a condition of error. And, and that's been a really important part of my own life and progression. Before I didn't have that opportunity, my soulmate understood far more about the human condition because of that than me. And now, because of all of these things I've been through, I now understand far, far more about it myself. So, yeah, it's a, it's a process for me of actually learning things that I didn't experience myself before. And that's yeah, this is the, this is the thing that's hard to understand. It's probably a judgment thing on my part, but it is to <laughs> but to know that say okay, if everything is exactly as you say, you are reincarnated from Jesus Christ, and we were taught that Jesus Christ was this super special being. Yeah, which is an error itself, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So with that concept, even though you learn a lot since then, you learn that. Um, Christ had a wife and had children, and this, whether you believe that or not, and all these different sort of theories are coming out, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's true. There's so much information out there. Mm -hmm. But it's still very hard to get over the blaspheming aspect of accepting that I can actually accept you as who you say you are, even though I want to, because I've got some feelings about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I know that's difficult. But isn't that what you're saying? It's about humility, it's about finding. God's truth, not the human truth or, or the conditioning truth that mm. we've taken on through the very existence of being here. So, yeah, well, I mean, it's the... like casting off and yeah. getting free. So, I mean, even though you might have a concept in the little box with a bow tied off and saying, I know the meaning of life, sometimes we're given the opportunity <coughs> to undo the box again and to re-examine. Yeah. And, and surely that's the excitement of what life's all about, isn't it really? True. You know? yeah. Which then leads you to explore divine truth. Yeah. God's truth. Yep. I mean, that's the way I see it because yeah. I've had to do a lot of re-examining and I, I embrace it. I think it's exciting. Yeah. And as long as it's all about love, hey, it can't be bad. It can't be too harmful. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the issue becomes, um, see, for myself there's a lot of concepts about myself that has been very damaging to the human race. I didn't create those concepts. People after my existence created those concepts. One of those concepts that was created was that I knew everything. Now, if you read your Bible, you will see that I said quite categorically that I didn't know everything. I actually said that my father knows all things and I, I know what he reveals to me. Um, and it's the same for you, by the way. You don't know everything, and you'll only know what your Father, God, reveals to you. <laughs> right? I also said that you are my brothers and my sisters. That doesn't mean I'm greater than you or lesser than you. Um, all I said was that we are the same. And so there's a lot of these concepts that have grown out of, this, out of Christianity, which is a modification of what I taught. Some of the truths remain but a lot of falsehood got mixed in with it, right? And one of the reasons why I wanted to return was because I wanted to correct those concepts rather than have them continue. So, so while at the moment many of you find it difficult to believe what I'm saying about myself, in the future it will become very plain to you um, whether I'm speaking the truth or not. And in the end, it... Uh, as long as you understand this concept of how to connect to God, you'll find that all of these questions will be resolved anyway. Now in the future, obviously, when it's God's timing, just like it was for me in the first century, certain things were accomplished because God willed it. And my desire in my own heart, which is the same as it was in the first century, is to just be the vehicle that God uses to actually give truth to the human race. That that is the choice that I made for my own life that I wanted to do. And you, you all will be vehicles in all different ways with your relationship with God and showing a part of God to the human race if you connect to God in that oneness state. 
And so we're no different in that regard. My aspect is that I just love truth. Your aspect will be different in different ways. Right? And, and so in the end, you will see what is the result of a person who has been into the 22nd sphere, back on earth and into the one that state with their soul back on earth in the coming years. Now you don't have to believe that at the moment at all. I'm not even asking you to. All I'm asking you to do is to just have a try of this connection with God, these three things. That's all I'm asking and presenting to you really. Um, and there are lots of different other things we can discuss, but really that's the primary thing. So my whole life, my whole life, if I apply these things, um, will change depending on how well I do them. Um, rapidly, as in work, work, home life, sexual life, you know, every single. Yeah, no, no fair dinkum. <laughs> <laughs> I felt the reaction of many of you fellas. Like, like, we talk about sex here too, are we? Yes, of course. <laughs> Like, God created sex, did she not? So why do you think I'll be not talking about sex, right? Like, sex is a part of your spiritual development. Okay? All of these aspects of your life will change if you do these things. That's going to take a lot more practice. Now, it's not so much practice, actually. <laughs> I get it. You get a very bit of pressure there, don't you? <laughs> you know, the funny thing is she'll want more practice. <laughs> it won't go straight over the top. Because <laughs> yeah. all of these things are a part of you just being in a state of bliss. Like, and so, how many of you believed that if you passed, there'd be no sex anymore. How many of you felt that? Quite a, quite, I find that usually it's quite a few people felt that. <laughs> well, actually, the sex gets better. <laughs> you would have to get better. <laughs> Connect with the emotion to clear it. Yeah. That is only the emotion you need to connect to, isn't it? Not the actual event. Well, right? usually you feel you will finish up remembering the events that created those emotions, but often it will be after you've connected to the emotion. So the, the true, the true thing with I don't know if most of you experience this in your own lives with memory, but memory is lost because of the denial of emotion. And memory is regained because of the acceptance of emotion. And this is a basic thing to remember about your own life. That you will finish up remembering all of your life because you've accepted all of the emotion from your life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it's a very basic important principle about your own development. So if you have blank areas of your life, and many of us do have blank areas in our life, it is because we are denying emotions that occurred during those time periods. Right. So how do you bring that up? What? The do first thing to do is to accept the truth, and that is, I am blanking out my memory about that period because there's an emotion there. So say that to yourself, say the truth. I am actually making a choice to deny that part of my life because there's an emotion there that I've wanted to run away from. And then make a choice. Do you want to keep running away from it? Let yourself make the choice to run into it now instead of running away from it. When you make that choice, you'll find the law of attraction instantly will kick into action and expose the emotion from that period of time that you're holding on to. It just happens automatically after you've set your intention. There's some things you've been coming up there. <laughs> I've cleared a lot of the emotion option going. And just cry and cry and cry. But yeah. I have no idea where it came from, other than it was obviously some trauma. <coughs> that but quite often, when you've got similar traumas day after day after day, in like you know, unworthiness or what, or being put down, yeah. there wouldn't be any one event anyway, would there, really? I mean, 
you know, some major things would be playing out, like perhaps a rape situation, but in the day-to-day -day emotions, we we put down up, not being allowed to cry things, yeah. there wouldn't often be. So it's by the fact that I'm experiencing those emotions, but don't know where they come from, does that... That's, that's that great. Comes, that is great. That is great. And with one proviso. <laughs> if the law of attraction is not changing, then you are not getting to the cause. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. If the law of attraction doesn't change, then you are not getting to the cause. So let's look at just a basic emotion. Let's say I'm, I'm overweight and I've always wanted to lose weight. Let's say it's just a simple thing like that. When I deal with the causal emotion of why my body wants to put weight on, I will automatically lose weight. I won't have to change what I'm eating or anything like that, although one thing that will automatically happen is my diet may automatically change without me being conscious of it, but I will automatically lose weight. So, if I'm saying, if I'm dealing with this, if I say to myself, I'm, I've dealt with that emotion, and I've still got the weight that I don't want, then the truth is that I have not dealt with that emotion. And I need to say the truth. I have not dealt with that emotion, and I'm allowed to not deal with it. <laughs> the truth is you have free will, you're allowed to not deal with anything. You're allowed to not deal with things. So I'm allowed to say that. And then, I'm, then I can say to myself, well, but do I want to keep making that same choice? Do I want to still have weight on me when in really when I look in the mirror I would prefer that I was slimmer. So then allow yourself to connect to the causal emotion. The causal emotion when it's released will automatically change. So it's the same with men, like if your body shape <coughs> you know, is not what you want and you're not as big as you feel and you're not seeming to assimilate the nutrients your body needs to create strut muscle and all that, well it's because of an emotion. While your body remains in that condition, right, it will be while you don't deal with that emotion. Right? Just like give you an example in my own life again. Last night, mate, I did a talk with around like 30 people or so there, and my back was just killing me the whole time. Now, my back today is a lot better, but it's still not good. Now, that's emotional. I was feeling something from the audience that was connecting with me. And I can feel these two muscles right in here just contracting, pulling my back around and causing my discomfort in my back, right? That's emotional. The instant I connect with that emotion, and I've been working on trying to find this emotion for some time, the instant I connect with that emotion, I will never have that problem happen again. Never. All of, my, all of the back pain I feel when I'm doing a group will disappear. Because I don't feel back pain in normal life, I just feel back pain when I'm in front of a group. Mm. Has that to do with because you have to uh, present yourself to people who are actually projecting disbelief sort of emotions? It's a, there's a lot of that. There's, a, there's a, quite a few different things because some people project like adoration emotions too and I'm uncomfortable with them too. So, so the ones who are projecting like disbelief, I, I get that. And then the ones who are projecting like belief but, but overboard sort of feelings, I get that too, and, and, and both of them I find is uncomfortable. Now what I need to do is get to the point where I don't find them anything, like I can just do it without feeling any discomfort, right? And at the moment I can't because of this emotion, whatever this emotion is, and it's a lot to do with unworthiness, I know that here, but actually I'm trying to connect to what it actually feels like, and, that, and, that, and I've been struggling with that for some time. Now the instant I connect to that will be the instant it disappears completely and I'll be fine. Yeah. If we've been trying to connect with the causal emotion and we're not getting any, anywhere with it, mm -hmm. wouldn't we just ask God to help us with it? That's what I'm doing here yeah, on this one on a daily basis, but there's another thing going on for me. I obviously don't want to feel it. Because <laughs> if I wanted to feel it, right at the moment I'd be feeling it. Yeah. Rather than feeling the pain of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I've also got to do myself is to have, look very sincerely at what is the fear I have about feeling this? What, what is going on in me that is blocking the experience of this? Because at the moment what I'm doing is blocking the experience of the emotion and it's 
coming out in my body. Yeah. So every disease that you have, or, or anybody has, any illness you have, is all the result of the suppression of some emotion that you could choose to feel, but you're actually keeping it away from you. That applies to every disease, by the way. Is yeah. old age a disease? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if actually we had the right able to have emotion, we'd actually... You'd never, mean, you wouldn't live forever, but you'd live for a longer time in a healthy condition. You, you, would, you can live for thousands of years and thousands of years. But who'd want it? But who'd want to, yeah. yeah. You know, obviously after a while you'd exhaust your time on the earth thinking, oh, I'd like to move on now and experience some other dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. um, certainly. But, but, and God actually made it in such a way that you could choose to do that. So, Methuselah <coughs> in the Bible was actually not a total myth. No, no. Historically, right back near the time of Amon and Amen, which were the first human couple, people lived for nearly th a thousand years yeah, on earth. Yeah. And that's the reality. Yeah. Um, how do you see your own part in the next few years as this, we come to this point where, uh, as a species, we connect with our emotional stuff? And uh, how do you see all that unfolding on a planetary scale? And how do you see that relating to the book of Revelations? Um, there are some truths, if I go for the back one first, there are some truths in the book of Revelation about some things about the future. But a lot of the book of Revelation was given by John to people in the first century. And then, and then what happened was there were lots of modifications on it. And these modifications occurred because lots of people in, in, who were in the 2nd and 3rd century wanted to try and oppress people in order to control them, so they wanted to generate fear. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the book of Revelation does have a lot of uh, things in it that are, that are very much fear-based and created by the minds of people on earth who were scribing the, and copying the book itself. That all being said, the future events obviously will there will be rapid changes on earth and a lot of these predictions about earth changes and all those kind of things will all occur. Now, um, I, my feelings about my own role about that is that um, all I need to do is just keep doing what is my passion. And my passion is to teach the divine truth to people, as many people as I can, who have a seeking heart in, their, in, their, in, in themselves. And then as they live that, they will change other people. And as they live that, they, they will change other people. And my feelings is that within a few years, my role is going to be just having some fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and hopefully that will be your role too, <laughs> just having some fun. And, and the amount of fun we're having just causes people to be attracted to us and say, well, how did you get into this state with all this stuff going around you? How, are you, how come you're having fun with this? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on? Why do you seem to be in this state of bliss? And so my desire in terms of doing this is Firstly, have myself in a state of bliss. Secondly, have myself and my soulmate in a soul union state in a state of bliss. So that I, we can illustrate to the world of what it means to actually have a relationship that's at the soul union state, which is that 22nd seer state. And then after that, my goal is just to have as much fun as possible. Cool. <laughs> the yogis that go into a state of essence, you know, they, you read about them, they, they do all these sort of things, and then they're actually... From what you read, I haven't seen it myself, that they are ecstatic, they're, they're, they're gone. You know? Is that because they have a, this divine connection, love connection with God, or is it because of a mind state? Um, there's a couple of things going on actually for them. One is that, um, if I can just illustrate it, and so here, here's the yogi on earth, right? With their soul, spirit body, material body. And I'm, I draw that just to remind you what you really are. Right? So here's their song. That's the real them. Many, most spiritual people on spiritual paths in the Eastern way of, of progressing are on the natural love path. So they're progressing towards the sixth sphere. What they're doing there is there is a spirit in the spirit world. Once this person gets beyond a certain part in their progression morally, there's a spirit in the spirit world who is already in the sixth sphere. So it's the sixth sphere spirit. And what they do is they project all of their emotions through the mediumistic connection into the person. And the person experiences their emotions like they're their own. 
So many six fear spirits fill this space, uh, state of void bliss. They, you know, they often call it nirvana, or you know, it's a void bliss. It's where bliss with a lack of desire, if you could call it bliss with no desire, in many cases. So it's not a desirous state. It's actually a state without desire in most cases. Right? But because you're now detuned from every sense that's going on within your own body and every emotion that's going on within your own body, what does it feel like? It feels like bliss, right? Because there's no negative experience whatsoever. Right? And this is how a six-year spirit feels. But they are not at one with God. I used to do a lot of meditating and I got into what I call the void, which was you'd meditate for a couple of hours and it seemed like a couple of minutes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but I sort of stopped doing it because there's nothing there. That's it's right. Void. That's right. So, and, and and the people who meditate, they tell you that this is what you're aiming for. Yeah. There's nothing there. Exactly, there is nothing there. No. And time just goes by and all of a sudden you wake up and you say, well, I know I was somewhere, but I was nowhere, and there's nothing there. What the hell was I doing? <laughs> yeah, it felt, felt great, I think. I, yeah, exactly. I, I'd feel, I would feel, um, not trance-like, but a bit sort of drug-like when you come out. You shouldn't yeah. drive or anything, because yeah. I'd be going, yeah. 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 for a while. But after a while, I thought, all I'm doing is actually drugging my senses. Exactly. In a sense. And that's exactly what most six fear spirits are actually doing. Mm -hmm. They're actually drugging their senses from the state of desire. Now, many of them, you know, decry desire, they actually belittle desire. The truth is that when you exercise all desires in harmony with God's love, you become passionate about every desire. Right? And every desire becomes blissful. So, so Buddha's actually totally wrong because he was on eliminate desire, detachment. I mean, I think he's misunderstood, but basically the way we understand it, that's the way... When you say totally wrong, he had a lot of teachings that are correct. Yeah. But that particular teaching, and Buddha himself was not a believer in God. Mm -hmm. He was a believer in the universe being God. Yeah, Buddhists don't believe in God. It, that's the basis of what they believe. Yeah. 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 And so, so they enter this state, and Buddha right at the moment is in a six-fear state, in this state of almost total void. So in other words, like stagnant. Um, stagnant, can't progress from that place and does not want to. What's no, their sex life? They don't have it. <laughs> they don't have any. No. So no. Void is vacuum. No, they don't have any. It's, it's um, what, what's going on with them. And you, you can see this even with the, the people on earth and the reflection of the teachings. Like the Dalai Lama, what, does he have sex? No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he, he actually practices celibacy. Right? Why is he practicing celibacy? Because he has this belief. What's the belief? Don't expect your energy. Well, no, the belief is that sex is actually a desire, and all desires are to be suppressed. To be suppressed. To be controlled. Right? And so what he's done is he's detuned himself from sexuality. Now, does God expect you to detune yourself from something God created? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make sense, right? This, this was a problem before, because half the time you were taught that actually it was like, like the Gnostics and all this sort of stuff, they were taught that this is actually the devil's sphere and sex was designed to keep you here. And Yeah, and this is all the priesthood trying to control you and make you feel guilty. Yeah. The truth is that God created sex and God created sex all the way through the spheres. And was sex created to give you a heightened emotional release? Sex was release? created because sex is the act of creation. Yeah. Oh, right. yes. Sex is the act of creation. And so there'll be a time when you're in the 22nd sphere state where you'll be having sex constantly with your soulmate. Come back as a rhesus monkey. <laughs> <laughs> you will be totally connected with your soul. So when, when you talk about sex in that sphere, you're actually talking about the physical sex we're talking about, or you're talking about a union of energies. I'm talking. Well, in the end, the physical sex you're talking about is nowhere near as powerful as the union of energies. Right. When that actually occurs, you're so it's actually not sex the way our limited understanding. No, it's not the actual intercourse process that. Our, but you know, the feeling you have during sex, those feelings will be permanently with you in that state. Mm -hmm. And like tantric say, will actually be in, 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 enhanced a hell of a lot more. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Right. 
So obviously if you have some problems with sex, <laughs> then it's important to also deal with those emotional issues because they are preventing you from being at one with God as well. So the only problem I actually have with sex is actually getting it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's God's solution? You've got to look at your law of attraction. Yeah, who said that? You've got to look at your law of attraction. <laughs> right, you're not getting it because there's some beliefs and feelings that you have about it that are actually out of harmony with love. Yeah. <laughs> Once you correct those, you'll find you'll get it. So when you talk about, now we're talking about masturbation, you're like self-love. So yep. is that... What level does that apply in relation to? Does sex have to be between two beings? Well, you think about what was sex created to do? Created. Created yeah. between two soul and hearts. So in the end, God's intention was that sex happened between two beings. Yes. What will happen is that you'll work through, as you work through the emotional injuries regarding sex, you'll get to a point in your own feelings that you will not be able to feel sexual, sexually aroused without the other half being around. Right? And once that occurs, you'll also, also have some very strong feelings about sexual arousal with your soulmate as well. So I had five years where I, where I felt no sexual arousal, very little sexual arousal at all. And then as soon as I met my soulmate, it just all went haywire. I mean, right? Because, I, because I've dealt with a lot of the emotions about it. I knew straight away, and straight away I was also opened up sexually as well. I, I thought I was just getting old. <laughs> uh, you, you can maintain this kind of, and, and the passion in fact can grow at the older you get. And it's actually the opposite way that most people feel. The reason why when we get old things seem to close down is because we've had the emotions in us for so long, they've affected so much of us, that, that parts of our body are now shutting down even in order to deal with our emotional state right, and still remain alive. So it's very damaging all these emotions that we store within us. But understand that the sex, can you see why sex is a part of your progression? Oh, I can understand. It's really important to understand that. It is a part of your progression because God created it. And anything that God created in its pristine state is something that is beautiful and you don't need to give it up. If you need to give it up, why would, you know, that does make no sense, does it? Yeah. Why would God create something in you and then tell you, you have to take it away to be at one with me? I've seen not very many people before now have actually said that God created it. It was always sort of hinted as being something else. Exactly, but who created the penis and who created the vagina in the end? <laughs> yeah, but the penis, you always have an idea of God being able to just say, poof, there it is. Yeah. You don't have to have sex to create it. God can actually just create it without sex. But why would he... understand it. Yeah, but why would he create it without it being used? It doesn't make any sense either, does And I mean, that's on the sex side, but I'm yeah. talking about as a creation aspect of God, God yeah. can create without sexual activity. No, every, every single time God creates... He is having sex. So actually, the, the, the theory <laughs> no, I'm that, serious. The theory that, that the world, the universe came into being by God masturbating and that created the universe was actually half right. It was sort of half right. God, <laughs> God didn't need to masturbate. God, God, was in this, God has masculine and feminine qualities in such a union that every time God experiences a desire, and this, by the way, is what you will be in that alignment state with your soulmate, Every time you to collectively, together, the two, the two of you, which are now one, experience a desire, you will create in that instance. No way. Whatever the desire is, if the desire is to make a house over there, bang, it will appear over there exactly as you had it in your desire. So we don't have to have any inhibition feelings or anything about sex because sex is actually a divine act. Sex is a divine act. If it has divine intentions. But if it also has love. 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 Well, that's a divine intention. Isn't it? Exactly. If, you, uh, if sex was created for creation, uh, where do homosexuals fit? Uh, they still have sex. Yeah. Like sex, remember, is an energetic transaction. The truth, the truth about homosexuals and, and heterosexuals is that in the earth, on the earth form in the body, while they might not be able to create another ch a child, they in the, in the spirit world they constantly create through a, through the sex act. 
right? Mm -hmm. So if we look at what's happening from a mathematical point of view, about well, you, many of you, some of you are mathematicians, I think, here, aren't they? So, you know, there might be one or two. But, um, you've all heard about standard deviation, statistics, and all those kind of things. Well, back to the school time, you know. All right. Let's imagine for a moment that this axis along here is the sexuality of the soul in its union state. So let's call this end really, really male, and let's call this end dominantly female. All right? Now in between there, due to just statistics, there'll be certain ones that fall between the 90 percentile range. And these ones in here will be a soul, which is, has two halves, and when they split, they will split into a masculine and feminine side. So they will split, split into a male, female dominant <coughs> portion of the soul, which of course will attract a female body for this one, right? And a male body for this one. And there will be an attraction between each other. Agreed? Yep. And so you could say sexual attraction is not really sexual attraction, it's really soul attraction between the two halves of the soul. Follow me? Now, when this dominantly male soul has feminine characteristics to it, but it's a dominantly male soul, splits, it will split in such a way that the two halves of the soul will be dominantly male. But they will still have an attraction for each other. And this is also why some male homosexuals are feministic. Yeah, that's right. Because there is a mixture of masculine and feminine qualities, but they are together as the complete soul, more masculine than the average complete soul. It's like creation in either of those, either ends. When you say creation, there's only no creation when they have the sex act on earth. Right? But there is creation in many other aspects of their life on earth and in the spirit world. So the, the, the dominantly male soul that's in, say, the sixth sphere yep. um, would be having sex and they would be creating because it's that energy level where they can do that. It's to do with the energy transfer, remember, yep. the feelings, the emotions that are transferred between the two that do the creation. So if God was like a perfect creator, how did he not actually have a 100% ratio of a male-female, Was there is there a design purpose? Yeah, just everything God creates has extremes right through the whole range in, to an infinite degree. Yep. So there is actually an infinite degree of sexuality in the complete soul, not just what I've drawn here. There's, and, and the infinite degree has yet to be experienced even, right, in either direction. And that's how God creates everything. There is an infinite variety of all of God's creatures. There is an infinite variety of all of God's uh, natural cre creations like you know, plants and trees and so forth. There is an infinite variety of all of these things. God is an infinite being and creates infinite variety. And so there is also an infinite variety of all the different types of souls when it comes to gender. So, if you're a heterosexual and you're sort of like homophobic, as they call it, yep, you've um, got an emotional actually, Yeah, you actually got to actually understand that, that it's just the way their soul is, their soul personality, design sort of thing. It's not that's that. There's something going on in your childhood that has caused you to have an emotional injury towards that particular gen that particular sexual union. Yeah. And the key is to allow yourself to actually connect with that injury. And it might be an injury of shame about something that happened, something that, you know, with regard to how your parents treated you or how your father felt about homosexuals and you want your father's approval. It can be really quite small like that. You know, I've had situations within myself where I've been allergic to an animal because my father hated it. And as soon as I dealt with my, father, with my relationship with my father, my allergy to the animal disappeared completely. Right? So, so understand that almost every single thing that we feel within us was created somewhere in our childhood and we've, we just need to release it. 
in the end, if you're in a state of love, you will love everyone, no matter what their sexuality, whatever they choose. Whatever they choose. If, there are plenty of people today on earth who are heterosexual but choose a homosexual experience. And later on, they'll work out why. Most of it's because they were injured in some way when they were children. So there are many so-called lesbians today who are together, who are together, but, but in reality they're heterosexual. But they're, they're, they're lesbian on earth because of the injuries they're unwilling to deal with. But that being said, there are many people in a heterosexual relationship that really are homosexual. Right? But actually, when it comes down to it, if they actually have a love for each other, there's actually nothing wrong with it, is it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if they act in harmony with love of themselves, they will be humble and deal with their emotions and eventually they'll find the truth about their own sexuality. Yeah. And I've talked to many spirits who passed, lived like 70, 80 years here on earth, passed over, they passed over in the spirit world, been there 5, 10 years, they've come to have a chat, and in our discussion worked out that they were homosexual and not heterosexual. Yeah. And they lived their whole life as a heterosexual couple with somebody. Yeah. Can I go back to something you said earlier? Sure. Um, with your suppressed emotions, do specific suppressed emotions always manifest in the same disease? Uh, yeah, many times. Yep. Yeah, that's the case. So like uh, cancers, for example, uh, related to different places in the body, are all related to different emotional suppressions of different different issues, yeah. yeah. There's a lovely book uh, written by a lady in Tasmania, I think, Annette Noontill, yeah. uh, called Emotions of the Barometer of the Soul. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th that, that, uh, that book can help you a lot, identify some of the you know, relationships, but it, there are more complex relationships that you still in the book. Yeah. But that yeah, is a that general book. That would be general information that she got, obviously. Yeah, she w it was channeled, yeah, by a natural love spirit who was channeling some information about that. And as you said on the DVD, the channeling is actually mm -hmm. it's actually planned and deliberate for a reason. Yeah, yeah, to help people come to this conclusion that my emotions create everything. Yep. Yeah, and it's very important to understand that all of disease, all of these things are all created by an emotion within. So I was talking last night to a lady who had breast cancer. Now I asked her which breast she had cancer in, so I think she said she had breast cancer in her right breast. And there is actually the left side of your body has to do generally with female, and right side of your body has to do with male. And that's actually a fact, obviously. Yeah, yeah. generally that's the fact. <laughs> when a person has breast cancer in the right side, it means that they are over-nurturing men in their life. And they're doing it because they have some deep feelings of guilt and shame that motivate themselves to keep giving, keep giving, keep giving. They can't even help themselves to stop keep keeping on giving. Right? All they need to do is to work through that emotion and the, the, the cancer will begin to heal. So giving in this sense though is not a love giving. It's, no, it's, it's, a, it's a giving because I need something in return. Yeah. Yeah. And that okay. was what causes disease. So, so every disease... Even things like um, Alzheimer's and dementia and all those kind of things that happen to the body are all the results of different emotions within the soul being suppressed. Now, the emotions that are suppressed, are they, that cause disease, are they actually suppressed in the organs then? Because what happens then if someone says, has a hysterectomy, um, is it the same for releasing the emotions or...? <laughs> yeah, let's look at it. Here's our soul. Our bodies are actually inside of our soul. Yes. Right? Mm. So let's say if I draw a, a female in this case, sorry about that, girls. Just draw with a dress, so she's female. Yes. And you could say her physical body is overlaid her spirit body, right? I think this is <laughs> One time I did this, I drew a male like this, I went like this. I went sort of like that. <laughs> right, so remember we've got sort of our spirit body and our material body, they basically overlaid each other, right? And then our soul encompasses those bodies. Now, in our soul, our soul is an energetic system. It's, it's emotions running constantly. And our soul's emotions 
um, cause energy meridians in our spirit body. You've heard of chakras? Yes. Right? Chakras are where 192, I think it is, energy meridians intersect. Right? It's in each part of our body. So we have chakra, 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 uh, what are we up to? Chakra, 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 chakra. That's seven of yeah. yeah. And these are energy meridians in our body. That, are, that our soul has the control of, not our spirit form, our soul. And our soul's emotions control them. You follow me? So, what's happening is, if a certain part of it, let's say I have an emotion of unworthiness, an unworthy, an unworthy emotion causes damage to these two energy meridians. Right. Now, if my unworthy emotion is related to myself and I'm a male, Right? And as unworthy emotions related to myself being a male, then I will have a certain response in those two meridians. Now that causes energy in my physical and spirit bodies to not flow properly in that region, which causes my body to not be able to completely replenish that area. Right? Which causes disease in that area of some type, depending on what type of emotion it is, and how the energy from that emotion affects that particular area of my body. But it's this soul, and you can think of this soul, this soul is like a swirling, swirling of energy going on all the time, right? Around it. This is your real self, swirling with energy, which is all energy in motion, right? Energy in motion, right? This is your soul. The soul, the real you, is just this energy in constant motion. And it's swirling around, and wherever the energy is stopped or blocked due to certain emotional, not wanting to experience, your soul not wanting to experience emotion, at that location there will be an injury appear in your spirit form, and correspondingly an injury appear in your material form. And that's the creation of all disease. Right. Hey, how can I help my niece? She has some kind of cancer in the yeah. in the in the brain. Back in the brain. Yeah. So it's a tumor in the brain. Yeah. Yep. And I can't tell you at the moment the exact emotion without actually feeling her, and I'm not connecting with her at the moment to actually feel her. But there is obviously an emotion that's affecting this area. Of of her body to create a tumour. Now this area here, the throat area, is about truth. And this area here is usually about spirit connection, right? So it's the mixture of those two things going on which would create the problem. And if she's got it near the base of the brain, it's probably do with the nerve central nervous system a bit as well. It's affecting the central nervous system then. It's causing her eyes to shut down and all sorts of physiological responses shut down. So look at what it's affecting and you'll start connecting with the emotions of it. Also, it's, a, it's about her connecting with what she's feeling while she's got this disease as well, if that makes sense. So every disease creates a feeling of its own usually within you. And if you can connect with that feeling, you will often find the source. Now, all of them are due to different emotions of some kind. But I can't tell you in her case what the specific emotion is without probably being with her for a little bit. And, and then I'll be able to tell. Um, usually I can connect to a person, but I'm struggling to connect to her. So that means, <coughs> does that mean she's due to move on? No, I feel it more means that she's quite resistive to having an external emotional connection with somebody she doesn't know. Uh, so quite, quite often I can connect with people because I, and feel them if they don't have that resistance to an external emotional connection. That's why sometimes it's only when I'm sitting with them that I can feel yeah. what's actually going on because they let me then. Mm. They, get, they see me and then let me connect. Yeah. 
I really don't want to go, but I've got to get up the six lane highway, I've got a low suspension ute. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, no, we're stuck on a rock when somebody else comes through. We're so. going to finish very shortly, actually. Yeah, I'm actually. busting to go to the loo. Yeah, uh, I think so. It's been great having your company, mate. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. All right. Yep. Okay. Been my pleasure. Yeah, and mine. <laughs> <laughs> and mine, we've got a light so yeah, um, the key is um, to allow to actually help her connect with what's going on with those emotions that cause that. Usually, things to do with the brain about uh, are a lot about things you don't want to remember. Um, and shutting down this in this area here in the in the throat region, which is also impacting the back there, is to do it with an intention of not speaking truth, not speaking your emotional truth. So how how does she go speaking her truth emotionally? Does she uh, tell she's people just her uh, overly nice all the time? Yeah, yeah. She really yeah. shut down yeah. with telling her emotional yeah. truth. And still is very giving to her husband, yeah. um, who's who's crying all the time. And yeah, she's so she's know, over nurturing. A lot, a lot of cancers are due to over nurturing people. <coughs> yeah, um, and you know that that's an important thing to realise as well. And if she shut down here, then not speaking her truth about it as well. So it's really important to, to allow, like, that she recognises those things now. I don't know whether she's willing to. Um, I get the feeling that she's possibly, possibly not willing to. Um, which will mean that she will probably pass as a result of that. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a matter of how much willing the person is. So it's nothing we can do. There is plenty you can do, because her willingness to speak her truth was very much created by your own willingness to hear the truth when she was young. Do you me? So deal with your own unwillingness to hear the truth, and that will help her want to speak her truth. So that wouldn't have been sexually affected, um, possibly um, as a young one. And what other issues does she have? Um, this is my nephew's wife, so right. I'm not sure. Usually if I sit down with a person, again, yeah. I can feel yeah. uh, what it is. It's hard to talk about a person without them yeah. letting me connect to them. One thing that you are capable of doing, though, and all of you are capable of doing this, is if you place yourself in a, in a, a meditative state or an alpha-based state, and if you just allow so like close, you sit down and close your eyes and just place yourself in a meditative state and then think about somebody who you worry about and just go and scan over their form. Like just with your eyes closed, just imagine you're scanning over their form, over their body. And then just whatever comes to your mind, just say like where, where their problems are. And you'll find that in many cases you'll be quite accurate with that if you really tune in. Because uh, actually every one of us is capable of feeling the problems in another person. Mm -hmm. right? So what you can do is actually scan over their form and, and picture their form in your mind's eye, just scan over the form and stop where you feel there's a problem. And then ask yourself, instead of what the problem is physically, ask yourself what the emotion might be. And see what emotion you feel at that instant. And that will help you a lot in terms of helping another person. After a while what will happen is you won't need to do that, but it just it helps when you're in that, in a calm state to be able to connect with that. Yeah. Yeah. Now I think it's probably time to stop, thank you. If we can stop now, and, and I'm thinking uh, we're going to do another thing tomorrow at 10 if anyone's invited to come along, if you want to come along and ask more questions or whatever, I'm happy to answer more. And, and I think it's probably the appropriate time to stop because I can feel quite a few are tired and, and those kind of things, although quite a few of you are still wanting to ask questions. <laughs> and it's been really great um, that you've allowed me to have a speak with you like this. And I know that many of the beliefs that you've had about all sorts of things have been confronted today and you've been open enough to actually consider that there might be some alternative, uh, alternative beliefs that might be just as acceptable to you. And so I'd like to just congratulate you for being open enough to accept that. And I've enjoyed myself doing, you know, talking to you in the manner that we've been able to do as well. So thanks for that. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.